out of any aircraft window, one expects to see blue skies and wisps of cloud. But when the clouds thickened into a dense, palpable whiteness, I knew I had reached my destination. A place where the hills and the people call the clouds their abode. The mighty Meghalaya. It's one among the seven sisters that make up the northeastern states of India. Virgin, enigmatic and breathtakingly beautiful. It's a long trip for me, travelling from New Delhi, but the first few breaths of fresh air are enough to lift my bodily worn-out spirit. I can't help but be completely hypnotised. The rolling hills, ensconced in clouds, the rippling waters of the lake, playing a forgotten tune as they lap against the shore and thick forests everywhere, which make Meghalaya one of the most distinctively biodiverse regions in the world. The tribes here are fierce protectors of their forests and land. The Garos, the Khasis and the Jentias, each with their own cultural idiosyncrasies. Curious to know more, I decide to visit the Don Bosco Museum of Indigenous Cultures in Meghalaya's bustling capital, Shillong, the starting point of my journey. This is Asia's largest museum of indigenous cultures, a temple of material about the tribes that inhabit India's northeast. A rich oral tradition has meant the history of Meghalaya's tribes has been largely undocumented right up to the colonial period when the three tribes, the Khasis, the Garos and the Jaintias, each with their own kingdoms, were brought under the administration of the British and declared part of the Assam state. Post-independence though, in 1972, the districts of Khasi, Garo and Jaintia hills were carved out of Assam and collectively became known as Meghale. But let's turn the pages back a little further and delve into what modern history doesn't tell us about the legends, the myths and the folklore that's still very much a part of day-to-day -day tribal life. All these years later. For that, I travel out of Shillong into the deep heart of Meghale to a village called Ampatti in the Garo Hills. Eager to meet Rudy, my guide too and researcher of Garo culture. Hi Rudy. Nice to meet you. The rural market is a tradition that has existed for long. Fresh produce from the surrounding areas in the region Brought in by sellers mm, traveling every day of the week. It is said that people once traveled two days and two nights to reach the market to buy their basics, which was traditionally held once a week in different villages of the region. But modernity changes everything. Today the variety of goods sold is staggering. And the market is no longer just a place to sell agricultural produce. Anything and everything is available and the place is bustling with bargain hunters. But there's more to the Garo way of life than traditional commerce. So Rudy and I travel into deeper hinterland, completely off the beaten track to Chidaugre. With oral histories, the quest for truth can be difficult. Nothing is sacrosanct, nothing's written in stone. With Garo history, it is no different. 
Previous researchers have specified their origin from Tibet, but more recent understandings of the folktales of Garo origin indicate there was a journey made to Tibet, but it was not their origin. They occupied this land long before. With so much variance in views, keeping the oral tradition alive is important since it's these theories and beliefs that ascertain the history and roots of the Garos. The Rudis brought me to Chidaure village, which is a typical Garo village, and I am going to experience firsthand the Garo way of life. This is a typical Garo village, almost untouched by modern life. But quite unlike other settlements, Garo villages are set up away from streams, rivers or any other water sources. Whenever the Garo settle in, in a place, mm -hmm. they plant jackfruit trees and mango trees. So the age of a village can be ascertained by the size of the tree. So this, so place, this is the jackfruit tree? Yeah. Life is simple in this cluster of bamboo huts, with plenty of time to catch up with the neighbours, raise kids and nurture finer talents. Here's something interesting, a bachelor dorm known as Nokpante. Once upon a time, they were there in almost every village. Today, only a few Garo villages carry on with the tradition. You can cite a Nokpante by the way it's built. Carvings like these etched out in front and, of course, by its occupants. The young sons of the village elect to live in dorms like this one with the other boys and the older men take turns to teach them everything they need to know about farming, hunting, music and dance. The idea is to prepare the boys once they leave the dorms and marry, to look after themselves and their family in a holistic way. Today, these boys are gearing up for the upcoming Vangala festival, celebrated by the Garo tribe before the harvest and as thanksgiving to the sun god. During the festival, rituals are performed in the house of the Nokma, or the village chief woman. All tribes in Meghale follow the matrilineal system. The family name and family property is inherited from the mother by the youngest daughter. The Nokma of this village, the head woman, is an elegant lady and she welcomed Hello. me into her home. Hi, Nokma, right? Nokma. At the entrance is a log of wood with beautiful carvings symbolizing the environment these tribes inhabit, placed exclusively in front of the Nokma's home and the bachelor dorms. So this is the main room of the house. Okay. This is the rice beer. So they've already prepared it. Oh. And they've put it in the for fermenting. And this is for the festival? Yeah, this is for the Wangala festival. All right. The rice beer, known as bichi, is a very important part of Garo culture. Special pots in the Nokma's house are used to brew and store the beer. Beautiful jewellery like this, waistbands, necklaces, earrings and bangles are passed down from generation to generation. This waistband belonging to the Nokma is made out of ivory and beads. Once worn, it accentuates the woman's waist, adding to the overall beauty of the traditional Garo costume. There's plenty more to see and sight in this idyllic village as I muster up an appetite for a traditional Garo meal. And now to the best part of any trip. Ah, oh, here comes the food. Thank you. Thank you. Well, no true Garo welcome is complete without a hearty meal at the end of it. So we're just going to dig in. Village life starts early, so it also ends early, which is why we're having a super early dinner. We start with some rice, served in a banana leaf, accompanied with some pork and a few chutneys. I love it. And what's unique, I'm told, is that there is a dash of cooking soda added to all their curries. Hence, the distinctive taste.
It's been an eye-opening experience, one that's made me appreciate another way of life, where a simple, self-sustaining existence that respects age-old tradition and legacy is still the dominant way of life. My next stop, Khasi Hills, and I can't wait to get there. From the Garo heartland, I make my way towards Wachen in the eastern hills, home to the Khasi tribe. <laughs> Tucked away into the hills, the people of Wachen stand apart for their unique profession, drum making. I've reached Bakken village in East Khasi Hills and Finbak is taking me for a small walkabout and we are of course in search for the legendary drummers. But before we meet the famous drum makers, I couldn't resist the urge to peep into Bakken's primary school to meet the kids. Uh, how do I say, uh, how are you? How are you? Kumnu? Kumnu Pilong. Kumnu Pilong. Okay, I'm going to try this. Beautiful this village. The walk down the village is long. We spot an old man making a basket, an art practiced by many tribes in the northeast. With each basket unique in design and functionality. This one is woven for people to carry wood. Wow. The famous drum makers of Bachen have been around for centuries, but they received formal recognition only as recently as 2002. These craftsmen create a variety of drums used in Khasi song and dance. Bakhen is a, is a very traditional village and uh, the, this extremely traditional art of drum making is being passed on as a legacy from father to son and this has been happening for many years, right? So do, uh, do people in Bakhen love playing drums? <laughs> And do you play it for a lot of your festivals? What's that? Festival, what is Khasi Kashat Kakman? Okay. They are playing many festivals. Okay. They like the Nongkrum Festival, the Shatsung Mansim Festival, and different festivals. 
So most of the festivals over here do involve some kind of musical involvement of the community. The whole community gets together, dances, sings and plays these amazing instruments. Pindak tells me that they have opened a formal school where traditional percussion is taught to the younger generation. The hearth is lit and Vahen is a classic example of a community that plays together, stays together. Tribal cultures across the world know the basic language of communion, dance. If you are disheartened, depressed, dispirited and you go to a local doctor, the first question they ask you is when did you stop dancing? This is life as it's meant to be, surrounded by the silence of the trees, the rustle of the stream, the majesty of the mountains and enchanting customs, a life that remained pure to its roots unspoiled by the complexities of modern living. And what I realize is that even when I leave this place, the music and beats will not leave me. My next stop, Jaintia Hills. Modernity often takes us away from our raw beginnings. But can early history be forgotten? Or is the stamp of tradition too deeply entrenched so as to be easily elapsed? I travel further east to the Jaintia Hills in quest of these answers. Ever since I've reached Meghale, I've observed large, ancient stone monoliths dotting the landscape. And I've been wondering what they're all about. So I've made my way to Narthiang in the Jaintia Hills to find out more about them. Hello, sir. Hello. Welcome, welcome to Jaintia Hills. Thank you. I can tell you this is the, the biggest and the longest monolith available in the Wow. This is, that's why we have been classed as one of the tourist destinations. This monastery, near Marp Lanki, mm. he assembled all his friends and what you call the elders mm. of this village here. And to commemorate the visit of the king, they started putting this monolith here. Okay. And this is the biggest monolith which erected by him only, with this Marp Lanki. This is the tallest monolith, standing more than 20 feet tall placed in remembrance of Mar Franki. Each uh, man brought his own stone and erected his own. And that's why till today, that person supposed from particular family, mm. from the clan, he erected then that belongs to them. So mm. every year, that particular clan, to commemorate the great deeds of those members, mm. they do uh, some sort of religious ceremony in that particular stone by particular family. And here they collectively done by the village. Okay. Because this being the monastery erected, so the village elders, they do the ceremony here. They do some ceremony. Yes. Legend has it that the blood of a wanderer sealed it forever. 
and not even the earthquake of 1897 could do it damage. It's just amazing to think that something so big and so unwieldy and heavy could have been erected more than 500 years ago. I mean, I'm just thinking about the engineering of these people to be able to make this stand and resist earthquakes and well, all kinds of natural disasters. It's still standing here. While in Jaintia, you can't miss color. There's lots and lots of it. Homes here are brightly colored in pink, purple, blue, red, some with patterns and designs on them and they are all quite unlike the homes that I saw both in the Garo and the Khasi Hills. What a vibrancy these structures add to the lush green of the hills. Long before Welsh missionaries began converting the people of these hills, the Jaintia people followed their own indigenous religion, the Niamtre. How then is there a Durga temple here? Durga temple was established and constructed by the Jaintia king. It's an old structure, despite the renovated exterior. The king of Jaintiapur, Rajinder Singh, brought this idol after he married a woman from the plains. He's believed to have placed the idol in Narthyang, making it his summer capital and the religious capital of the people of the Jaintia kingdom. This temple has seen human sacrifices being performed through several years. According to the Pujari, who is the 29th generation Pujari at the temple, the last human sacrifice took place during the reign of King Prabhatroy, way back in the 1800s. Oh, this is the this sword with which they did that. This is the sword for the human sacrifice and that one is for the goat. Today, sacrifices are still made, but a goat is guised as a human for this purpose. stop is Joai, a bustling town where I get a chance to witness a Thanksgiving ceremony for the birth of a baby. Come, come. Hello. Hi. Congratulations. Oh, hello. Oh, you see your Hi. I can't stop looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> hello. Welcome to the world. <laughs> The ceremony takes place at the mother's home. In the matrilineal system, the Khatto, or the youngest daughter, inherits all the property and is the caretaker of her parents, of her clan and, of course, of the property. In most cases, the men return to their mother's home upon the death of their spouse. <laughs> Women play a significant role in the functioning of society. History has it that as the Jaintiyas were wanderers, they wanted the women to be the caretakers. So if villages were plundered in their absence and the women had to bear the children from other men, there would be no bastard children. But this is not to say that men don't play an important role. No decision can be made without the consent of the mother's brother, the mama. It is he, in fact, who takes all important family decisions. So, yeah, so I also pray for a very happy and fulfilling life for the baby. Okay. And as I come close to the end of my journey, here's something spectacular. A traditional dance of the Jaintia people against the backdrop of these hills that make up Jawai.
Chaar Chhat Ke Laapli Ang, as it is called. The dance is performed during the sowing season, spreading the message of love and joy and praying for a prosperous harvest. I realize it's the same dance performed to entertain the king when he made his visits to the summer capital of Narthiang. I am absolutely blown away by the beauty of the Garo Hills, the colors of the Jaintia Hills and the music of the Khasi Hills. But I'm still trying to learn the ropes. So as you can see, this is only the beginning. So join me as my adventure in Meghalaya continues. See you next week.